Let me begin by saying that I'm uh, gratified, actually, at how the last two days have gone in, or two and a, however long it's been, two and a half days. Um, for they, by and large, um, managed to circumvent a fear which I had had, which was that this conference might, like so many other conferences, uh, drift into a narrowly focused uh, set of issues which have to do principally with the past and only secondary or tertiarily uh, with the present. And that hasn't happened from the keynote to the most recent uh, lecture and in uh, virtually all the presentations in between, uh, in, in, including the historians and the biographers who, uh, at the same time as they told us it was not their place to judge, nonetheless managed to maintain a kind of contextual vibrancy and relevancy with regard to contemporary issues that I think is absolutely instructive uh, for all of us, and perhaps they do it better than we uh, frequently. Now, turning to intellectual matters, I guess I've been most struck over the last two days. I was up early this morning because <laughs> I realized that I had made a mistake in making myself comment on the conference. It, mean, it, means, it meant I had to listen to it first and then <laughs> have some thoughts. Um, <laughs> I think we all could share that idea. But um, I've been struck over the last couple of days with the almost univocal desire among people who know Royce best among us to uh, take measures to minimize, or minimize his absolute idealism and at the same time maximize his later work on community and ethics and philosophy of community and language. Um, and, it, and I was interested in Matthias Girel's uh, comments this morning that this actually parallels in many respects Gabriel Marcel's um, presentation of Royce as well. That's, that was quite intriguing. Um, McDermott at the opening lauded Royce as a pointillist, ignoring, I think, uh, or drawing attention to the way uh, Royce puts together the whole out of this attention to the parts. Um, but I wonder uh, if, if by trying to set somewhat aside um, some of Royce's mechanics, uh, we in some respects ignore the technique uh, solely for the purpose of looking at the, at the broader composition that's appealing. Now, it's an interesting problem vis-a-vis -vis, uh, virtually any thinker one might treat because most decent thinkers actually manage to change their mind and develop over time. <coughs> Uh, and, and certainly Royce does, and so treating him where he winds up, just as uh, some of us are inclined to treat James as much where he winds up, uh, is, is definitely warranted. But what it underscores for me is a matter of, that really has to do with interest or with the way uh, our interest is connected to reading these materials. And here our interest, as I think Cornel West so clearly exhibited is in Royce's ethical sensibility, his continued attunement to tragedy and evil, as Peter was just mentioning, um, and his attempts to, uh, to constitute and, uh, if not constitute, at least ameliorate community. Um, and, and I think this is a, a crucial thing to note, but also to be aware of in terms of what's what we're doing with that and the tensions that are built into that. Now, Royce's reputation as a philosopher in his day depended in the main in his achievements, his technical philosophical achievements uh, in this work, which, which we've been shying away from some, in some respects. Um, and it's interesting, in fact, and I would say here, Pache to Cornell West in responding to, to Bob Richardson uh, with regard to his quotation yesterday of the center of my gaze comment. James says to, writes to Royce, you're at the center of my gaze while he's preparing his own Gifford lectures. And, and, and West was rightly drawing attention to the real uh, depth of this friendship in the two of them. Uh, but at the same time, I think we also have to see that there's a bit of uh, rivalry and one-upsmanship regarding philosophical reputation um, that's also in play here. Not to be the biographer a moment, but <laughs> for a moment, but Royce was the accomplished philosopher in 1900, not James. James was a psychologist. 
James recommended Royce for the Gifford Lectures, indeed, just as Cornell West said. But he recommended him for the Gifford Lectures that were at Aberdeen, which was the first invitation he received because he wished to get the more prestigious invitation to <laughs> Edinburgh, which came a year later. <laughs> And Royce was the stand-in for philosophy, when, and, and this is a deeper point, both a shallow and a deeper point, but Royce was indeed the stand-in for philosophy when James wrote in 1900 to Francis Morse that his goal for the variety, varieties was to defend experience against philosophy in matters regarding religion. <laughs> So in Royce's day, it was, it was Royce's achievement in that earlier work which James sought to displace. And this was partly out of philosophical conviction and certainly partly out of rivalry as well. James, of course, was uh, uh, amazed and also intrigued by the fact that school grew up immediately around John Dewey. Uh, and, and this raised questions for him about <laughs> himself. Now, as Frank Oppenheim has noted several times over the last days, uh, central to Josiah Royce's later writing is, is not only God and theism, but something crucially Christian. There's an imminent working out of the idea of the church in the problem of Christianity, which is, I might add, uh, from Royce's point of view, the central Christian idea, not merely the central idea for a philosophy of community. In other words, it's not that these two things simply run in parallel. Royce also takes this as a, as a normative center to Christianity. And in, in theologically, there's a long tradition of referring to the church as the body of Christ or the bride of Christ, etc. So uh, Royce is not being particularly inventive here. Now, it's interesting for those who don't share Royce's theological convictions how much of Royce can be wrested from this. There's certainly, certainly one can take out, out of problem of Christianity his philosophy of language, the Persian elements, etc. But as one of the questioners mentioned yesterday in regard to uh, Frank Oppenheim's paper, one might well have scruples about the problem of universalizing atonement. Um, so the question is, with regard to dealing with Royce, is digging into the details of his notion of community and what's presumed about that uh, and how those visions work. Incidentally, uh, just as a side comment related to this, apropos of, of uh, Oppenheim's paper and the suggestion of the connection to James's idea of a science of religion, and I remarked this to him after uh, the paper, it's worth observing that while James advances this science of religion idea in one of the, one of the last lectures of the Varieties of Religious Experience, and he trots it out again here at Harvard at the summer school uh, Divinity Summer School uh, session in 1903. After 1903, along with the idea of supernaturalism, James does nothing with the science of religions. Now, that idea, if you remember, uh, James said, well, maybe um, what we could do is get together a group of people and they could sift through all the r religions and find out all the ideas that were held in common that were good, and then we'll just keep those and we'll toss the rest away, right? That's the idea of the science of religions. And I'd suggest that it dawned on James that perhaps this wasn't adequately pluralist enough um, to forward ahead. So there's a bit of a, a, a stronger diremption. Uh, in, indeed, Royce is certainly delivering on this idea. It's quite evident in Problem of Christianity, uh, as, as Frank Oppenheim's paper showed. But James himself has qualms um, based on his pluralistic uh, ethical considerations um, and, and not merely others. Now. Relatedly, I think it's crucial to note, I've been claiming that uh, religion is crucial for Royce and Christianity in particular, and that we just have to note that and keep that in view. Religion is also central to James. Um, and, and hence, as Peter was pointing out, religion really plays an important role in this tradition. 
But religion is not important to James in the same way uh, that it's important in our day as a social problem or a potential social problem. That is, across the academy, the growing interest in religion is driven now by its influence politically, socially, internationally, etc. But James's concern, by contrast, and Royce's to a certain extent as well, was how one could continue to have religion, whatever religion you might happen to have, how to reconcile religion with philosophy and science. And that's not exactly the take that the majority of academics, at least, uh, tends, to, tends to look at here. Um, so James reflected on the idea of whether religion needed to survive, determined that he thought it did because it played some absolutely critical roles, and then tried to philosophize about it in a way that left it flexible enough to mesh with uh, a deep and thoroughgoing kind of pluralism to have a sort of openness, uh, but that didn't have it either segregated from the rest of our intellectual life, such as Richard Rorty suggests uh, in his own reflections on James and philosophy of religion, um, or have it coercively inhabit our collective life, right? Both of which James wanted to avoid. So James sides on the uh, variant individual model. Royce goes the direction of the possibility of community, but I want to suggest that balancing that possibility of community with the kind of pluralism James is interested in uh, is difficult. Now Dewey, of course, offers a way out for some here, and Sandra Rosenthal's paper, I think, was very to the point on this. But it's crucial to note and this is again back to Peter's comments, it's crucial to note how much more toothsome James's and Royce's approaches to religion are in comparison to Dewey's far thinner sensibility. Now this flags for me at least, uh, and perhaps for some others, the necessity of continued and maybe renewed philosophizing about religion, um, which is today mostly lacking. Cornell West, in a, in a piece, it's probably from the 1980s, I don't know, but collected in, in one of his books from the 90s, spoke about this uh, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, as the golden era of philosophy of religion in America. Right? And today, to the extent that there is philosophy of religion, it's very often cast in an apologetic tone internal to specific religious traditions without a notion of the actual fulsome human community as its scope, but rather solely as a handmaiden to uh, different religious traditions. And I want to suggest that Royce and James say there's no way that can be productive and that our current world suggests that there's no way we should be ignoring this. Now, um, an observation on uh, James, and I think this is my last point, but we'll see. Um, we've seen over the weekend a number of people uh, from, frankly, from John McDermott to, to Cornell West prefer James, uh, or sorry, prefer Royce to James on ethics. Um, John McDermott pointedly put this in a response to John Locke's paper saying, uh, well, you just take William James's metaphysics and Josiah Royce's ethics and move on. <laughs> right? Now, there's something not wrong about that, but there's also something a little bit off. Um, Harvey Cormier noted the Morris and I Swift quotation concerning the Cleveland working man, John Corcoran, in the first chapter of Pragmatism we see that James has an attunement, at least late in his life, uh, to moral atrocity, if he, even if he didn't have it all the way through, as Ignis Scripskelis' observations uh, certainly illustrated. Now, part of the problem I would suggest in judging James's reflections on ethics and morality wanting uh, comes from the fact that most of his explicit and, and dedicated writings on morality are fairly early in his career. 
So we see, for example, in John Locke's paper, having to lean on the moral philosopher and the moral life, which dates from 1890, uh, where James's conception of the ethical situation is driven by individual demand satisfaction. I have a demand, you have a demand, third person has a demand. We're all obligated to satisfy the maximum number of demands we can come up with. And we're morally obligated by these. But once James shifts in the 1890s to his radical empiricist metaphysics, okay, so we'll take James's metaphysics for a moment, um, then, is, then the good becomes a social and communal and also an individual matter. It's not merely what an individual desires or demands, though it's still responsive to that, but it's also the genus socially for, the, for species like truth. So in pragmatism, truth is a species of the good, but by virtue of that, the good is the genus, and truth itself is naturally social, co contained and held by uh, a larger body of people than simply the individual, and hence so is the good. So what I want to suggest is there's a good deal more resource here, even if, and, and I think admittedly so, uh, James's recognition of the tragic is not built into his temperament, right? Part of what we like about Royce, those who find Royce's recognition of the centrality of evil, is we like that temperamental character of Royce. But temperament is not everything in philosophy. It's just where you begin. <laughs> So I wouldn't be so quick to be rid of James's ethical resources um, at the outset. Um, now, finally, I want to I note something that hasn't been thematized explicitly, but that's crucial to the contemporary value of these thinkers, the contemporary value, which for me has always been the drive here. That is, we have to study and get our heads around what's going on then, but the reason for that is in the now and to move us toward the future. And, and that feature that I think is crucial to note has to do with the dynamism throughout these thinkers. I spoke earlier about the preference for the later Royce or the Royce reflecting on and with Peirce. Part of what one gets, as Jackie Kegley noted, is the movement, the dynamism, the triadic productive quality, which as she noted moves Royce in many respects towards something that looks like process thought. Now, the value, of course, of pragmatism is its orientation to the, di to the dynamics of the present situation, its experimental attitude, but most its practical and, and problematic intent vis-a-vis -vis the dynamism of the present oriented to the future. And it's James all over that has this, and principally the later Royce. Contemporary renditions of um, pragmatism are often uh, presented as utterly eschewing metaphysics. This is, again, one of Richard Rorty's bequeathings uh, to us. And, and as a corrective to many things, it's helpful. But one of the questions, and I think one of the things one sees with James and Royce, is the necessity of thinking about the, some hard questions about the nature of things periodically as a way of getting a grip on how one can get a handle on the forces that are in play in the situational present. And, and so attending to the dyna, dynamic quality that runs between these two thinkers is, I think, crucial. Okay, I'll stop there and turn it over to my professor and teacher, Hilary Putnam. Okay.